I believe if the Holy Spirit could leave, 80% of churches in America would go on as normal, wouldn't even know. We wouldn't. We have smoke, we have perks, we have jokes, we have comedians in pulpits. Not every church, but for the most of us, we are having in America, Western Hemisphere Christianity, we are having entertainment-led services versus Holy Spirit breathed on encounters. And so we laugh and we say church is great and we have our tea and we have our latte. But then when you go right back to your stress, it's nothing to keep you on Monday. Nothing to keep you when you're tested. Do it all, worshiping. My prayer has been, God, would you breathe fresh on this series? I ask it every time, but I just feel because I know what it feels like to question the gift that you've given me because I'm stressed. I could just imagine how other people in the world feel. So could you breathe on this series? And I'm like, God, we're going this direction towards the holidays. Why? And I felt as though God revealed to me, it's because when you are stressed, you don't burn for me. I don't want my people to have a flicker. This time, I want them to have a fire. A fire. We talked about it last week with John the Baptist. I want to show you John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. It says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Hmm. Keep going on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verse 3. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. That separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 29 tells us, for our God is a consuming fire. We're going to war with stress so that you can get your fire back. Can I speak prophetically right now? God is saying no more flicker. I don't want a flicker of worship. I don't want a flicker of commitment. I don't want a flicker of faithfulness. I don't want a flicker of fasting. I want you to be on fire because when you have my fire, you could burn. And when you could burn, I could burn away your lust and I could burn away your anger and I could burn away your greed and I could burn away your, your pride. You can't do that with a flicker. A spark doesn't even really burn. I want you to be on fire so I could burn it because hell loves the people who profess much but burn little. Fire. I want you to have that fire on the inside of you because that way I could burn up what the enemy is trying to do in your life. And there is nothing that can affect your fire like a difficult person. <laughs> Some of us would be on fire. <laughs> it's like that part though. Nothing can affect your fire like a difficult person. So let, let's, let's park right there and let's talk about that for part two of this stress management series. Let's talk about how to deal with difficult people. Because sometimes you stressed out because of difficult people. Am I talking to anybody? Yes. Don't say amen too loud if you're married. <laughs> and next, yes! Your husband haven't been that loud all week. <laughs> difficult. <laughs> difficult people. Difficult people are an excellent training facility to reveal if you really have self-restraint or self-government. Oh, they practice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Difficult people are a wonderful training facility. To see if you really know how to display the love of Jesus. We just were singing purify. I want to be tried by fire. God's like, do you really? <laughs> do you really know? Yo, Gabriel, you heard that? <laughs> she was singing purify. Really? Okay. Okay. I got you, ma'am. <laughs> yes, it's, it is a excellent training facility training facility difficult people difficult people i'm talking about people 
who never really acknowledge when they're wrong. Those type of people. Difficult people. Difficult people. The people who have an entitlement issue. They think things are supposed to just be given to them. Like you're just supposed, like difficult people. Difficult people. I'm talking about professional manipulators. Like they are pro at it. They can't stand a light they can't eclipse. And they always feel like they have to unscrew your light so that they can shine. Difficult people. Difficult people. I'm talking about people who are allergic to saying, I'm sorry. People who are allergic to saying I'm wrong. Like it actually hurts. They're these type of people where they apologize in their head. And if we hear them, that's on us. That's on us. I apologize. You just didn't hear it though. (laughs) Difficult people. Difficult people. I'm talking about those who have to have the last word. Difficult people. Difficult people. The, the, The types of people who have to say what they feel in a moment where it's not required now. Just difficult people. Like they have PhDs in petty, but GEDs in being mature. Difficult people. Difficult people. There's some difficult people. All right. I know. (laughs) Yeah, that's one right there. Being in denial that you difficult. Difficult people. Difficult people. What do you do when you have to deal with difficult people? It's almost like those of us who recognize we need healing and are trying to get healing due to people who don't think they need healing. Did y'all hear what I just said? Like, I'm trying to get healing from somebody who doesn't think they need healing. Difficult people. How do you deal with difficult people? And I know, I know in the house, you got the answer. Online, you probably like, Pastor, I already got it. Cut them off. (laughs) That's not a deep SAT question. Cut them off. My cutoff game is so strong. I'm talking to you. That's why I'm looking at you. My cutoff game is so strong. What do you mean? What do you do? I cut them off. I block them. I no longer do life with them. I unfollow them. Matter of fact, I cut the umbilical cord when I came out the womb. My cutoff game is that strong. I will 1990s Full House episode Joey cut it out so fast so somebody... Anybody in the house, your cutoff game, like swole, like you got a strong, be honest, put it high, like I got a strong cutoff game, okay, all right, time to come for your throat, not your throat, your throat, be coming for that. What do you do? Somebody was like, that's why I didn't raise my hand. (laughs) What do you do, though, when the difficult person is tied to your promotion? See, see, we're going to lose all the amen corner right here because this means to cut them off is to cut off your promotion to block them is to block your promotion. That's not biblical. Come here, Judas, without you, if I would have cut you off, I couldn't have got to the cross. What if difficult people you needed to elevate and some of us have been cutting people off into a place where we're stagnant. I don't see change. You cut off everybody who will help you. That's not help. Is it not? I just don't think that's biblical. I'm going to give you another biblical character uh, by the name of King Saul and David. David, the eighth son of Jesse. He has the battle of living in between two dimensions. He has to navigate between two places. I want you to see this. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. It says, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. Somebody say he oily. oily. Anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. The text does not say David got anointed and then Samuel took him to the palace. So he has to learn how to operate with an anointing that doesn't match his place. 
Stay with me. How do you manage the season of where my oil doesn't match where I am? And it's, and it's like this on purpose. You got a palace anointment, but you have pasture placement. And you have to have the character to be humble, even though you know that's where I'm going, but I'm still in the pasture. This is profound because if you recognize that you have a palace anointing, you won't date nothing in the pasture because you know I'm not standing here. I'm not staying here. I'm not catching feelings for anybody in the pasture because I'm not staying here. But how do you operate with a sense of confidence of knowing where you're going, but then also a sense of humility because I'm still in the pasture? He, he has to operate between two dimensions. He's anointed to be king. He is appointed to be king. Now you have to understand this. David did not go to any king university. He didn't have king discipleship class or a how to be king master class. He wasn't in a king's institute. It's just that the king of kings anointed him to be a king. Stop letting your lack of a PhD make you think you're not qualified if your anointing has called you for it. Nobody has ever asked me what my education is. Nobody. Because when you have a call on your life and an anointing on your life, it speaks volumes for itself. Am I saying be uneducated? No. And all by getting, get understanding. But what I am saying is don't make yourself feel as though unless I get that. I'm not minimizing the value of education. We could use Peter and Paul all day. Peter was anointed and passionate. Paul was anointed, passionate, and educated, which is why he had more to contribute in the text in the New, in the New Testament. So education does matter. However, he is in this place where he's anointed, he's appointed, God has blessed him, but God left out some important information. Saul was not a part of the itinerary when Samuel was pouring that oil on my head. When all y'all said he oily, Samuel never said you anointed, but you're going to have to deal with Saul. Every person who is anointed, you will have a Saul. You will. And if you're like, I'm going to cut them off, this means you miss your Jonathan and your palace. Talk. Jonathan will become David's best friend. If you cut off Saul, don't have nothing to do with him, the blessing of a Jonathan you'll never experience. Because every time somebody's difficult, you cut them off. Let, let's, let's dig into the story just a little more. Because King Saul has a little issue with David. All right? It's kind of funny because Saul's spirit to people. Oh, let me put it this way. People who are like Saul view your blessing as their problem. Did y'all hear me? People who are like Saul view your ministry's growth or your entrepreneurial pursuit growing as their problem. Like they view your favor as their problem. They got an issue with you because God is blessing you. That's a Saul type heart person. This is why the Bible says a wise person can overlook an offense. One definition of overlook means to be above. So I'm overlooking the valley from the hill. This means a hater, a critic, or a Saul type person can never throw rocks down on you. They have to always throw them up. <laughs> Did y'all hear me? They can never throw anything down on you because you're above it. They got to throw it up. Saul has an issue with David. And I want to show you where it started. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 5. It says, so David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war. Now it happened as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women came out of the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet David. No, that's not what it says. To meet David. Is that what your Bible says? 
to meet King Saul, okay, with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Remember, they came to meet who? Saul, all right? Then Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. And he said, they've ascribed to David ten thousands, but me, they only ascribe a thousand. Now, what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. Let's pause right there. We're going to pick back up in a second. I'm like, okay, I got a huge problem with this. Because verse 5 says, Saul placed David over the men of war. That's what the Bible says, right? Okay, this is, this is my problem. How is it you place David over the men of war? He comes back from winning the war. Everybody's celebrating that y'all won the war, but you can't celebrate because you tripping over his stats. <laughs> I'm tripping. I'm like, bro, you won. Yeah, but they singing about David, though. See, please hear me. Difficult people sometimes don't like you because other people speak good of you. <laughs> oh, I hope this take a weight off you. What did I do? What? Nothing. They, they have an issue. It's that you're like people celebrating or honoring or gleaning from whatever you do. That exposes their insecurity. Why you keep wondering, what did I do? And maybe I shouldn't. And how? It's nothing about you. It's they can't stand for somebody else to be celebrated besides themselves. You, you, you set him to do this. Can I mess y'all up? Jealousy and stress will blindfold you to where you're winning. <laughs> Somebody said, they ain't get it. He is upset that they won, but it goes under his record as his victory. What in your life does Satan have you feeling as though you're losing? Because your stress has blindfolded you to where you got the victory. It's too much, sis. I can't. <laughs> we flowing now. You, you got the victory, but you can't see it because of what you want them to think. God is pouring out blessings on your life, but you can't see it because they don't see me yet. Could you imagine what type of warrior David would have been if he blamed the fact that his father, Jesse, called all of his brothers in the house and left him in the field? And he felt as though they overlooked me. And now they're sending his praise. He probably would have been turned up. Yeah, I am on one. See, Jesse, see, you had me out here in the pasture with these sheep. See, look at me now. Listen, y'all go ahead and sing it, lady. Go, David. Go, go ahead. Listen. But he had his heavenly father give him the affirmation so that when other people sing praise, they don't faze him. Some of us have abandonment and healing issues so deep where God really can't cause anything in your life to grow because you will start to get cocky because you don't have your affirmation in him. You're looking for it from them. And he knows if I were to allow this to happen in your life, we barely talking now. I want you to know me so much so that when I give you success, you don't lose your sense. Remember me. I'm the one who gave you the power to do this.